From National Review headquarters in New York City, this is a Capital Writing author interview. Capital Writing is a project of National Review Capital Matters and part of our mission to explain, defend, and celebrate capitalism. Our guest today is the one and only Scott Lincecum of the Cato Institute. He is the Director of General Economics and Trade there, and he is uh, the editor, but also the author of a couple parts of a new book that Cato is putting out called Empowering the New American Worker. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole list of different policy proposals to help American workers from uh, a wide variety of different policy areas, from different experts uh, that are all, uh, you know, writing on their area uh, in a way that policymakers should be able to uh, to learn a lot from by, 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 by reading this book. So, uh, Scott, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. All right. So, uh, you <clears throat> call the book Empowering the New American Worker. Uh, what makes the American worker new? What does that word mean in the title? What is it that uh, is different about the American worker now than in the past? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we set out to write this book, why um, it, it's become my baby over the last year, is that uh, I really grew frustrated hearing about pro-worker policy or helping American workers um, via policies that were not only, you know, always about more and bigger government, but also that tended to totally ignore the vast majority of the American workforce tend to ignore pretty radical changes in the U.S. labor market, particularly during the pandemic, and ignored uh, all sorts of survey materials and polling on what American workers value, what they don't value, uh, and quite frankly, just the diversity of opinion out there. Um, you know, if you were to only watch Sunday shows or political speeches, you would think that there are basically like two workers in the country. You have a unionized nine to five assembly line breadwinner male, probably in you know his late 40s or early 50s. Um, and then you're going to have some uh, college educated urbanite single or couple um, that maybe is considering kids um, and uh, again has a, a, a lot of education. Now, uh, the reality uh, is, of course, that uh, those stereotypes surely exist, but they're really not representative of uh, the vast majority of the American workforce. Um, that, you know, for starters, uh, not a lot of Americans actually work in manufacturing in terms of a total share of our workforce. Not even blue collar male workers are primarily in manufacturing. In fact, there are four times as many uh, male dominated industry workers in things other than manufacturing than there are in manufacturing. Um, and at the same time, um, given the pandemic and other things, we see that workers actually uh, really are increasingly valuing flexibility and independence over uh, sort of pr government protections or mandated benefits um, or um, this kind of cradle to grave labor policy we hear so much about. So um, part of the the point of the book is to drill into those things. And then, like I said, to explore some of the, the latest changes in uh, the American workforce. Uh, you know, a big part of that, of course, is remote work. Um, we went from about 5% of the workforce working remotely before the pandemic to you know, around 25 to 30% of the workforce, even today, are working uh, remotely either some or all of the time. Um, we're, you know, before the pandemic, we thought everybody wanted to move to big superstar cities on the coasts. Now, um, and people actually are moving to the suburbs or to small and mid-sized cities in, in, the, in the Sun Belt. Um, we thought we knew what, we, what workers wanted in terms of um, the employer-employee relationship, but it turns out uh, an increasing number of Americans want to go freelance. They want to be independent contractors. Um, so all of this divides the conventional wisdom in Washington about the American worker. This is really the new American worker. The reality is, quite frankly, uh, the title is very, maybe hopefully catchy. The reality is that the American workforce isn't uh, the, a couple stereotypes. It's this really diverse and 
ever changing group of individuals with all sorts of hopes and dreams and priorities in their working lives and the rest. And so what we tried to do, part of what we tried to do in this book is create labor policies that don't assume that the worker of today is going to be the worker of tomorrow, that don't assume these stereotypes represent all workers, but instead try to maximize uh, individual autonomy and flexibility, help workers adjust to whatever shocks might come along, um, and really empower them, allow individuals to pursue the, the things they want to pursue, um, to have the jobs they want to have, not the ones that a few folks in Washington think they should have. Yeah, I think that was a central tension in the book. Uh, it wasn't between Democrats and Republicans or between conservatives and progressives. It was between politicians and normal people. And, yeah. um, and what is it that you think uh, like what is it about Washington? What is it about being an elected politician? that for some reason creates these uh, stereotypes that don't actually hold up to the reality of what people want. Well, I mean, some of it, I think, is just classic interest group politics, right? Um, when you have a large group of steel workers from the steel workers union knocking on your door, uh, you're going to be paying a little more attention to steel workers and maybe be supportive of things like steel tariffs. Um, or... Uh, quite frankly, you know, you're trapped in the D.C. bubble um, and staffers and policymakers uh, tend to think that everywhere has the same problems that Washington, D.C. has. You know, um, for example, Washington has some of the highest child care costs in the country. Uh, the, the, the numbers are absolutely insane. Um, and a lot of that is due to uh, really onerous child care regulation related to like staff ratios or credentials. Uh, in fact, D.C. just upped the credential requirements for daycare workers just recently. Um, so I think the other thing that, that happens is you, uh, you tend to think that the little bubble you live in is reality. Um, and that includes things in terms of worker priorities, in terms of whether it's two earner couples or high housing costs or whatever. Um, you tend to think that's that's reality. Um, and then some of it, I think, is also just uh, the the kind of punditocracy, right? You're you're you read the same people, you read the same publications. Those publications have their own priorities, and, and that tends to, I think, seep through policies. Well, you know, I think a good example of this is on independent contracting. You know, uh, maybe because of where people live in Washington, because the only contractors they deal with are, are Uber drivers, or maybe it's because, you know, all they're reading is, uh, you know, certain publications. But everybody think, seems to think that all independent contractors are gig workers, right? Well, it turns out that according to the IRS, uh, less than 10% of all independent workers are, are gig workers. That in fact, most freelance jobs are really well paying. Uh, freelance workers find them to be more secure and satisfying than traditional employment. And they're really uh, a, lucrative. Um, you can make a lot of good money doing this type of work. And this is lost on a lot of Washington, who, you know, President Biden's new Labor Department regulation wants to dramatically curtail independent work. And it's all based on this really uh, incorrect stereotype about the nature of the work. So when you put together the interest group stuff, when you put together kind of the beltway bubble stuff, um, I think that combines to provide a, a pretty uh, incorrect view of, um, of the labor market. And then I would add one last thing. Of course, um, you know, most of official Washington is a gerontocracy. You know, everybody in, in in Capitol Hill is like 70 years old or whatever. And I think that yeah, that also um, gives them some distorted views about what today's labor market is. Sure. Uh, one of those distorted views that I think this book does a really good job of, of beating back with just, just, just with descriptions of the facts, not even with the policy recommendations, is the idea that uh, the United States has been some kind of ultra free market economy uh, and you know you hear it on the right people like to if people on the right are attacking free markets they like to talk about market fundamentalism if people on the left are doing it they like to talk about neoliberalism 
And uh, this book does a really good job, I think, of laying out the fact that like we have an extremely interventionist government in a lot of really important areas. And there are even ones that areas that uh, we just kind of take for granted. I think one of the ones that was interesting to me was the chapter on home ownership, which basically said there's no other country in the world that has as much government involvement in mortgages and home lending than the United States. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is the other big motivation for the book. So you, you've you've done your done good homework here because uh, um, because the the other big misconception in official Washington, uh, and you hear it all the time on the right and the left, is that free markets are unfettered markets have failed workers. We have pervasive market failures in all sorts of areas. And thus, we need you know pro worker government intervention to fix this. And like you said, this really ignores uh, the laundry list of state, local, and federal policies that exist in all sorts of areas, whether it's occupational licensing, or healthcare and childcare, or simply the essential goods: food, clothing, energy, transportation. Um, or like you said, in home ownership and, and housing affordability. So we have all of these pre-existing policies in place um, that raise the cost of essentials, that distort markets, that prevent the delivery of top-notch services, um, like healthcare, for example, um, and just make it harder for workers to adjust, to move from place to place or job to job. You know, you mentioned um, uh, home ownership and, and mortgage subsidies, right? Well, uh, you know, home owning a home is can be great. I, I own a home. I love to, to fix it up and I, I enjoy the solitude. But, um, you know, getting people into mortgages they can't afford turned out to be a pretty terrible thing during the Great Recession. Um, and especially when people, it inhibited people from selling their homes and moving to communities that might have adjusted more quickly or that had implemented better state and local policies and were now thriving. And it trapped people in these, in these struggling places. And if you look throughout our labor policy and other economic policies, you find time and time again that we have uh, policies that well-intentioned or not are really inhibiting workers from adjusting when the inevitable problems arise. Um, you know, the other another great example is health insurance, right? So we have this uh, archaic tax preference for employer-provided health insurance that was basically an accident um, dating back almost a century now. Um, and that uh, has created what we call job lock, which really ties individuals to their employers. You know, you hear all about employer bargaining power and all the rest of this. Well, uh, you know, almost anybody will admit one of the big reasons why they stay in a job or why they're afraid of losing their job is because they're afraid of losing their health insurance for themselves or their families. This is totally a byproduct of... Uh, our current tax policy and tax treatment for health insurance. There's no reason why your employer should be picking your health insurance for you um, and, quite frankly, uh, doing so ineffectively or or at least in a really expensive way, right? And this this is just yet another one of those areas where if you were to listen to official Washington, you'd hear – we have a market failure in health insurance. We need single payer. We need nationalized health insurance. Or even on the right, we need all these subsidies for um, for for premiums and the rest. Um, when you know, how would we know if there is a, a market failure when we have so much government involvement in not just the demand side? So that's on you know the health health insurance employer side, but also on the supply side where we restrict. Uh, licensing for nurse practitioners. We uh, restrict uh, foreign doctors from practicing here. And we have all sorts of other supply side restrictions, certificate of need laws at the state level that raise the cost of care, limit the supply options, um, and, and thus just make uh, the healthcare market the furthest thing possible from, from a free market fundamentalist paradise, right? And, and you can really, again, you can go down the list of, of um, 
issues that workers care about. Uh, you scratch beneath the surface of that market failure, and almost always you're finding a bunch of government policies that are, are making things much worse. So one of those issues that politicians seem to believe that workers care about is that uh, they want to have the same job uh, for as long as they can. They, they, they want to have uh, really high job security and that they value that over other things such as pay and such as uh, uh, benefits and all this sort of thing. And you guys put together some pretty interesting survey data in the book that shows that if you actually ask workers what they want, a lot of times they're perfectly willing to take higher pay in exchange for uh, less job security. And then if you look at it between countries as well, uh, countries such uh, European countries that have much stronger uh, protections or much stronger uh, job security from uh, government mandate actually end up have producing less well-paid workers. Right, right. Yeah, if you, again, if you know, if you're listening to the most prevalent debates on the right and left about labor policy today, um, you know, they can't agree on a lot, but they can agree that workers are pretty helpless, that and need uh, cradle to grave protection. We need more labor protections. We need more government involvement in the relationship between employers and employees or uh, companies and contractors, you name it. We, we need more government. Um, but this, uh, again, perversely, this type of protection actually ends up um, per the some, some pretty cool new economic research uh, to make workers worse off in terms of lifetime earnings, in terms of productivity, because they don't end up uh, switching jobs. Job switching can be really good, not just in terms of getting higher pay, does it can do that, but also in terms of finding the right match and being more productive in the job you find. And so, like you said, uh, the study looked at the U.S. labor market, which still has a relatively fluid labor market compared to Europe, um, and found that over uh, workers' lives, uh, they actually ended up having higher earnings and a better uh, work quality in the less protected labor market. And this, I think, gets to kind of a fundamental, again, misunderstanding of American workers. Most American workers are not helpless. Um, as we've seen in, in the current labor market with the great resignation and the rest, um, there are benefits to changing jobs. And uh, workers are willing to take a little bit of a risk and, and move on, as long as, of course, we have a, a strong and stable economy when, when they do it. And so um, it's really essential that labor policy and that other policies don't uh, hamstring workers and trap them in jobs that you know might seem secure today, but in the long run are uh, actually going to make them worse off. Um, and quite frankly, you know, as we know from a, a lot of protectionist uh, policy and, and the economic literature on it, um, those jobs might end up going away anyway um, due to fundamental shifts in things like automation or technology or trade or whatever, right? And so uh, the best thing we can do in terms of policy is to prepare workers for those shifts and to help them make those shifts. Um, you know, foot voting is great. It's great for politics, but it's also great for, uh, for economics. It's, it really is important for Americans to be able to move to better places um, or places that they prefer. Um, that's, that's just really good for a properly functioning economy, not just for a properly functioning political system. It's important for that too. Um, and we want policy to, to, to not uh, throw up walls preventing, preventing that. So you mentioned that workers don't feel helpless uh, without government protection. And one of the other interesting things to just note about the United States in particular is that they don't seem to feel helpless even though they're not part of unions. Most, most, most workers in the United States, in the private sector anyway, are not part of unions. Um, yet they seem to feel as though they do have a lot of ability to improve their own outcomes and improve their own careers without the benefit of that uh, bargaining system that we hear from the left so often is supposed to be uh, a make or break. Yeah, and you know, um, to be 
to, to be clear, I, I don't have any real problems against people wanting to f join a union or form a union or whatever. Uh, I think the bigger problems really in, in that regard are, are related to U.S. labor law, right? You know, when you're forcing a union uh, relationship, when you're forcing employers uh, and employees to join unions, that's, I think, where things, uh, where the problems arise. Um, and it's that compulsory unionization that, that creates problems, and particularly given, again, workers' preferences um, for, for other types of em employer and employee relationships. Um, you know, nothing wrong in, in theory with, with doing that, but most people don't really want to. Uh, they find that they uh, value more the independence, the autonomy, the flexibility, and all that kind of stuff, um, and none of that's going to come um, from a union job. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, uh, 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 let's see, occupational licensing, I think, is is another area that is sort of a, a typical area that libertarians talk about a lot and always have. Um, but when you look at it through this context of policies that can help workers in particular and not something that's about, you know, improving overall economic efficiency, but something that's just about, like, look, we're, we're blocking people out of jobs. We're blocking them out of of, of, of careers that they could do and would benefit themselves and their, and their communities by, by doing so, and we're preventing them from doing it. And another example of that is, is uh, from uh, people with criminal records. And, yeah. uh, and uh, it was astounding in the book, the, 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 the graph, I mean, first of all, there's so many graphs in this book. Uh, if you're, if yeah, you're, I love if, charts. If, yeah. if you're into this, if, if you're into this kind of stuff, uh, you should definitely check out this book. But the, the one that uh, I, didn't, I didn't fully realize until I looked at it is just the incredible increase we have in the proportion of Americans who have a criminal record. And, um, and, and, and the sizable chunk of the workforce that has to deal with the with that with that problem, and and a lot of these people didn't didn't do anything uh, terrible, and you know they did something a, a long time ago, but it still follows them and makes it hard for them to get a job. Yeah, yeah, I think both licensing and criminal justice are some of my favorite chapters in the book. Uh, I I wrote the criminal justice one, so of course I'm biased, but um, one of the reasons, and one of, so one of the things you hear, particularly on the right, is about labor force participation, how men in particular are not working anymore. Um, and of course, there's a lot of focus on trade and disruption and the rest these days. Um, but, in, but in occupational licensing and criminal justice, what you see is just as the world was becoming more disruptive, just as how depressed labor force participation was becoming a bigger issue, so, you know, throughout the 90s and, and thereafter, um, we were dramatically increasing the scope and number of professions that required a license and thus had a government gatekeeper, um, thus increasing the costs of entry or just to flat out establishing a barrier to entry. We also were uh, throwing a lot of people in jail or at least um, uh, provide, you know, uh, giving them a criminal record. Um, you know, again, like you said, you look at the charts and there's, there's, uh, tens of millions of Americans today that have a record. There's millions more that have a an arrest, uh, not a conviction, but an arrest on, alone. And uh, the latest economic literature shows that a simple arrest on your record can dramatically reduce participation in the labor force um, through either unemployment or just flat out non-participation. You just drop out entirely. Yeah, it is important um, to note. It is important to note too, just for listeners, that like we're not talking about people who were imprisoned. I mean, some of these people were, but a lot of these people were never actually in in prison. They were just they were arrested. They had some kind of you know misdemeanor charge and things like that, uh, but still face these negative consequences. Exactly. Yeah, this is not, we're not talking about murderers. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly that's, that's in the group, but millions of people affected here are, are dealing with nonviolent crimes, crimes from when they were teenagers, you know, from decades ago, or things that they, for which they're arrested, but eventually acquitted. And thus, you know, in our system are, are innocent. So um, you combine that then with occupational licensing. 
Um, there are numerous occupational licensing restrictions on people with any sort of criminal record. Again, even if it was decades ago, even if it had nothing to do with the job at issue, um, and, and again, even if you were just merely arrested, right? Um, and so when you combine these two things together, what you see are uh, a really witch's brew of in, encouraging or, or preventing people from fully participating in the labor force. Um, and then we, we know that there are some pretty easy solutions that some states have started to take, which is actually, I think, one of the optimistic things in this book. You can get kind of depressed reading this book when you look at all these policies in their place, and there's a lot of cronyism and, and protectionism involved in a lot of this. But there's also an optimistic message, because in a lot of states over the last decade, um, we've seen reforms pursued as per some of the recommendations in this book. Um, Arizona, for example, has started doing um, universal license recognition. So they have um, essentially said that, look, if you're licensed anywhere else in the country and you move to Arizona, you'll be licensed here, right? Other places like Florida have done thorough reviews of their licensing systems and said, you know what, we have a lot of bogus licensing jo li jobs that are licensed, like you know, hair braiding or um, uh, boxing referees was one, auctioneers, you know, <laughs> really crazy stuff, right? And they've just gone ahead and, and eliminated those licenses altogether. Um, on the criminal justice side, uh, Pennsylvania was one of the first states to embrace automatic expungement of criminal records. Uh, now, again, this is not for, for murderers. This is not for people who just got out of jail. Um, but it is for people that have gone a significant period of time without an offense, that had a nonviolent offense, that had an offense on the record that isn't even a crime anymore, you know, like drugs, drug possession or sports gambling or the rest, or um, they were arrested and, and acquitted. So Pennsylvania just says, look, we're going to expunge that from your record. And studies show that that not only leads to tens and thousands of Americans um, no longer having a record, um, something they wouldn't have done if you'd made them apply for the expungement and the rest, but also dramatically increases labor force participation. Um, in fact, you know, we talk a lot, especially on the conservative side of things, about Social Security disability insurance, right? Uh, you know, the, the work, people aren't working because they're on disability. Well, it turns out that the criminal justice non-participation is like three times as much. It's like almost two million workers affected by the criminal justice stuff compared to less than a million workers on the on the disability side. So it's not to say we shouldn't you know, reform disability, but um, if we care about non-participation on that side, we should definitely you know, care about this too. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying we should we should definitely fix disability still. But but yes, uh yeah, the um uh that that's that's that's, that's totally right. I think uh looking at two issues that really affect young people, and by young people I don't mean like kids, but people who are just entering the workforce or who are maybe uh, relatively, uh, you know, people under 30 probably, uh, are the issues of, of child care and education, and then also the issues of, of housing. And these are two things that are, um, uh, are becoming bigger issues in a way that they probably weren't in the past, even though obviously uh, those, those have always been important concerns. But there's a lot of people that just feel like buying a house is something that they can't do, uh, yeah. which is crazy when you think about all the things that government does to try and make it easy to buy a house. Uh, but there are still so many people that do that. There was an interesting comparison in the book between countries, which I didn't realize that this varied so much country to country. But in the United States, about two-thirds of people own their home and about one-third rent. And I thought that was... I thought that was sort of typical, but it turns out in a lot of other countries, the ownership rate is higher, and um, uh, and, and and the uh, and the rental rate is is lower. So, what is it about housing in the United States? Uh, I know the UK and Canada are facing many of the same problems that we are, and yep. actually are in a slightly more advanced stage of it than we are. Uh, what is it that we can do to try to turn that around? 
Oh, boy. Uh, housing, like you said, is, I think, a critical area. Um, and it's one that when you scratch beneath the surface, you find government at basically every level mucking things up. Um, you know, at the federal level, um, let's just start with the tariffs, right? We have tariffs now, um, either in the form of your kind of traditional tariffs or these trade remedies, these dumping duties and the rest, um, on almost everything you need to build a house. So on lumber, on steel, on countertops and cabinets and appliances, you go through it, right? Um, we at Cato uh, commissioned a study from a, bunch, a couple economic economists, uh, academic economists um, a little over a year ago to have them look at the effect of these tariffs. And they found that, unsurprisingly, um, as you increase tariffs on housing materials, you increase the, the domestic cost of those materials. It's almost a one for one. So when you increase the cost of construction materials, um, that makes your bottom line cost of building new homes higher, which means that builders are going to not focus on starter homes, right? They can't, they, they have to focus on the higher end stuff so they can, they can make a profit. Um, it also, of course, means that the cheapest a uh, house can be um, in, say, places that don't have really onerous land use regulation. We'll get to that next. Um, it, it's going to be higher than it, it needs to be. Um, tax policy with respect to mortgage interest deductions, the rest further can goose policies at, at the federal level. Um, then, you know, at the state and local levels, we... Uh, the big one here is zoning and land use regulation, right? So study after study after study has shown that onerous zoning and other land use restrictions that say, say you can only build a single family home in this neighborhood and you have to have a certain amount of um, front yard and you, um, you can't build above a certain height and, and you have to have par free parking and the rest. Well, these things dramatically increase the cost of housing around the country. Um, a recent study found a zoning tax of up to $500,000 per, I believe it's quarter acre um, of land. And, and that, again, is just simply an additional barrier to home ownership. Um, studies have shown that this that high housing costs are, are kind of a wall around prosperous places because lower income workers simply can't work there. And then we do other discrete stuff like um, we don't provide we don't we, we have major restrictions, regulatory restrictions on manufactured housing. Um, we deny HUD loans to uh, certain types of manufactured homes. We prohibit outright innovative forms of housing um, that could again lower costs. So when you add it all up, um, we do a ton of stuff that makes it really, really difficult to either own a home or to afford your rent. Because of course, this can uh, increase the cost of multifamily housing and, and raise rents as well. Um, and, and that really matters, like you said, for young people. You know, people who want to buy starter homes, um, well, starter homes barely even exist anymore because of all of those additional costs that the tariffs and uh, the building fees and permitting fees and all this stuff add to the bottom line cost of a house. Um, and, you know, whether we like it or not, um, you know, uh, home ownership is a, a wealth vehicle in the United States. I would actually prefer it be less of a wealth vehicle, but uh, it is what it is. And um, while we don't think everybody needs to own a home, um, we actually, we really shouldn't be doing things to make it impossible for them to do so if they want to. Exactly. And it, it sounds like a similar dynamic to, uh, to automobiles in the U.S. where we have so many regulations that the most sensible thing to do if you're a car manufacturer is to make a lot of really big cars because then you can <laughs> then you can sell them for a lot of money and uh, and do this. Is it a similar thing with housing here that you have all these regulations? So in order to justify all the inputs you have to put into it, you 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 gotta you've got to build a giant house and sell it for a million dollars. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, funny you mentioned that because, of course, the transportation chapter in the book yeah. covers a lot of these things. You know, we have uh, tariffs on all sorts of automotive parts. We have tariffs on pickup trucks of 25 percent, raising the cost 
of cars, um, and then all sorts of other aspects of our transportation system. You know, it, uh, building infrastructure and financing and managing infrastructure, um, the, what we do with gas prices, uh, what we do with alternative forms of energy, with uh, tariffs on solar panels and all this stuff. Um, we do all sorts of things that make it more expensive to drive, more expensive to take the bus or uh, ride the train um, and uh, keep us stuck in traffic. You know, part of work, if you're, unless you're a remote worker, uh, is the commute. And we make workers' commutes miserable um, by uh, really restricting innovative forms of infrastructure and, and transit and, and, again, by making cars expensive. Um, you know, that... You mentioned the big SUVs. I mean, that's actually, you know, mentioned in the in the book, is uh, cafe regulations uh, intended, of course, to uh, reduce emissions. Actually, encourage, due to some loopholes and technicalities, uh, the, the bigger cars. So, you know, one of the reasons why everybody likes an SUV or drives an SUV is because that's that's um, uh, we can thank our, our good old uh, regulations for that. There's there's one particular transportation policy that I know you're fond of talking about. So I just want to give you a chance to get that off, get it off your chest. Oh, um, Buy American or NEPA? Both. No, no, not that one. Not that one. The Jones Act. The Jones Act. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw Sorry, it was in there. So many... I, I don't want to get you in trouble. I don't want to get you charged with treason, but I, I do, I do want to give you a chance just to, to get that out. Right. And, and this, I think, um, so, of course, for those listening, uh, you'll know the Jones Act is a bit of a hobby horse for me and my some of my fellow colleagues at Cato. Um, it restricts uh, shipping between U.S. ports to ships that are owned by Americans and made by Americans and flagged in America um, and crewed by Americans. And thus... Uh, dramatically increases the cost of building ships and transporting goods um, via ship between U.S. ports, which is uh, ridiculous because we have so much coastline and so many ports. Um, but also it's ridiculous because um, we have congested highways full of 18-wheelers. Um, we have uh, a potential energy crisis in New England because we can't get Gulf American-made oil and gas to New England via ship, um, you name it. So the Jones Act pops up throughout this book, um, not in its own chapter, but in uh, the chapters on transportation and the chapter on essential goods and other places, because um, you know repealing the Jones Act would be great, but I think it's essential for us to show that, to talk about these things in the way that American workers, Americans, uh, to think about them, right? People don't really think about, ah, I need to uh, liberalize maritime shipping, but they do think about, wow, why is gas price, why are gas prices higher? Or why can't I get heating oil um, in Massachusetts this winter? Um, or why are there so many 18-wheelers driving between the port of Savannah and uh, Washington, D.C.? Right. And so on and so on. Well, uh, you know, you find out that the Jones Act is to blame in little bits for, for all of those things. And uh, so, of course, you know, getting rid of it or reforming it uh, would, would would go some ways to, to improving the situation. One of those simple things that I think uh, more people are talking about and more people are are taking advantage of is the opportunity to work from home. And you, you have uh you have sort of two chapters in the book about this that are taken from different angles. You talk about one with sort of the entrepreneurship angle uh, yep. of people, you know, having businesses that they run out of their homes, you know, their own small businesses. And then, of course, people who work for large companies and work work from home um, and, and those being separate things. But they face some similar issues, especially as it comes uh, to tax policy. Um, and these are things that you know, policymakers weren't thinking about because it wasn't really a problem when they wrote this stuff. But like, how do you tax somebody who works in one state, but their company they work for is in another state or they work in multiple states? Uh, how long do they have to be in that state before they get taxed there? And all these kind of questions. Um, you have some recommendations in the book about how to streamline that and make it make more sense. Could you explain that a little bit? 
Yeah, sure. So, you know, remote work is a relatively new thing. Um, and, you know, th this remote work is one of those areas where, unlike some of the things like the Jones Act and baby formula tariffs and the rest, um, this really isn't a classic DC tale of cronyism gone wrong. And this is just about how tax policy uh, at the state and at the federal level uh, was created in a time when remote work really didn't exist. Or if remote work did exist, it was like traveling salesmen, right? So uh, the problem in typical government fashion, though, is that as remote work has exploded, uh, tax policy hasn't kept up. So like you said, um, you can now face multiple different differential state taxation if you work in a state for a single day. Um, tax policy doesn't consider a trip to the office for a remote worker to be similar to a trip to the office for a, a standard worker, for somebody who goes in every day. And so the taxation of fringe benefits is off. Um, private employers and, and CPAs have been begging the Treasury Department for guidance on these areas because tax policy just right now doesn't make a lot of sense. And that type of uncertainty and the additional tax burden that's involved um, will essentially, you know, inhibit remote work. Now, uh, you know, as I say, this, this might sound like a broken record. This does not mean that everybody should be a remote worker, that government policy should be actively uh, encouraging everybody to remote work. But instead, we tax policy should be neutral. Um, you know, Congress at the interstate level, states at the state level should just ensure that a remote work job is treated the same as a standard job. And in terms of all these different tax things, um, other areas, though, in like occupational licensing, we see this, too. Um, healthcare and telemedicine, we see this as well. Um, you know, these new technologies that allow people to live where they want to live and work how they want to work, that employers are finding really valuable in terms of expanding a labor pool or providing uh, goods and services to new customers. These types of things tend to be beneficial for, for most folks, and yet government policy just hasn't really caught up uh, or in some cases is actively um, restricting that behavior um, due to, you know, to some sort of you know, protectionist issues. Yeah, this was one of the areas in the book where, you know, most of these chapters end with recommendations of repeal this bad rule, get rid of this bad rule. Uh, and this is one of the areas, I, I think, where you you uh, you see a, a role for government to actually make a positive difference of, yeah. of, of actually coming in and saying, like, look, th like we can we can we can use policy to actually improve this the situation. Yeah, for sure. And and I think independent work is another area um, where, where this applies, right? That, you know, the taxation of independent work um, is really complicated. I know this as being a contractor in my uh, spare time as well. Um, you know, it is really hard to track your expenses because there is no standard business deduction for sole proprietors and independent workers. Um, and there's all sorts of other rules um, that just make being an independent worker unnecessarily difficult. And that doesn't even get into the AB5 stuff in California or the Biden administration rules that are like actively trying to harm uh, or limit independent work. And this is just for people who are engaged in it, who are freelancers doing it on the side as maybe a side hustle or whatever. Um, and it's really um, a, a mess to uh, file your taxes correctly. And that, of course, opens you up to penalties um, and all that additional burden and paperwork makes it less likely you're going to engage in the practice. And so, you know, part of, again, part of the book is just, hey, repeal the Jones Act. Um, but a, I think a lot of it, too, is really pragmatic solutions so that people, that workers can, can do the type of work they want to do. Um, that can, and, and then again, kind of empower them to be the people they want to be. Yeah, I was encouraged by that part of it because it seemed like the kind of policy that's not a left-right issue. It's not a thing that people get really upset about. Um, this is stuff just like, can we just make the tax policy make sense? Like we can say, whatever the rate is set at, you know, that's a left-right issue. But uh, can we just make it clear how workers are supposed to pay? And, and who they're supposed to be paying it to. Um, that's the kind of thing that I, I, I would hope uh, that, that, that left and right could, 
could uh, come together on it in a, in a sensible way. You, you would hope, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I think that throughout this book, and I haven't done a, a text search, right? You'd probably find a, a dozen or so of these lurking throughout, right? Just kind of antiquated tax or regulatory treatment of a worker that no longer exists um, and that don't really have any ideological baggage, right? You know, look, uh, healthcare tax treatment, I think, is idiotic, but that's that's a that's a fight, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, one I'm will we, we're of course willing to take on because it's so valuable, but it's a fight. Uh, so there are a lot of these others that just just don't make any sense. You know, I, going back to housing, um, our treatment of manufactured housing is really dumb because it's based on the kind of old view of manufactured housing as being a trailer, right? You know, trailer park, mobile home, whatever. Um, and now we're 3D printing houses in certain places of the country. And this is the type of stuff that we really need to get in front of, um, given all of the pressures we have in the housing market already. And while there might be some opposition from, you know, a, a builder group here or whatever, in general, there should be a pretty strong left-right consensus that these just these rules make just no sense in uh, you know 2022. Yeah, um, and then sort of underlying this entire discussion uh, is the first chapter in the book, which is the macroeconomic foundation for 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 workers, and just sort of the idea that that uh, economic growth is is a good thing for for everybody. And there's a lot of talk, especially on the left, about income inequality and how that undercuts this argument for economic growth. But there's a lot of really good data in, in this chapter that shows how, uh, you know, uh, people who are not as well off really do benefit from, from growth. And I think one of the other areas as well is the problems right now with inflation, you know, uh, it, it, 8% annual inflation is a bigger problem uh, when you're spending uh, when, when, when you're spending more of your income on uh, goods and services that you used to be able to afford more easily and now are having a harder time doing so. That's, that's an issue that higher income people don't, don't face as much uh, as lower income people. And so uh, the importance of getting that macroeconomic foundation right, I think, just seems to be a huge point of emphasis uh, that policymakers haven't paid enough attention to. Yeah. Yeah. This is the kind of do no harm section of the book, right? Yeah. That, yeah. that you can, you can talk all you want about these micro uh, fixes. You can talk all you want about um, whether it is, you know, healthcare policy or housing policy or fixing licensing or criminal justice or whatever. But if you mess up the macro stuff, none of it's going to matter. Right. That that there is a uh, a part of this that is we really need to be careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. That um, and, and that's what I note in the conclusion is that, look, after we implement these market based reforms, after we then see where there might be real market failures, even then, we really need to be careful to ensure that um, we're not doing stuff that uh, reduces labor productivity, because that's really what's driving, uh, you know, generational wealth, and and doing things that aren't uh, inhibiting growth for for those same reasons. So the macro section kind of just sets it out at the front. It's like, look, there are kind of these basic fundamental things we need to universally recognize about growth and incomes and productivity and the rest. And, and we, we need to understand that first because, you know, the ship, as long as we have the ship going in that direction, then we can debate the deck chairs all we want. But if you, you know, if, if you sink the ship, then, you know, you, you got big problems. Um, you know, one of the stats in that macro chapter that I loved was on the limits of redistribution as well. And I think that's another big point. Um, and, and I think, carries out throughout the book, that while we're, one of the reasons why we're trying so hard to find market-based reforms in all of these areas is because, you know, redistribution at the end of the day just isn't what's really moving the ball down the field in terms of generational wealth and living standards. Um, you know, the stat, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch it a little bit, but, you know, if you had redistributed every penny that of wealth back in, you know, a hundred years ago or whatever, um, you'd have 
crippling poverty today relatively, right? You know, th people living on $3,000 a year or whatever it was, um, because redistribution is just simply insufficient to produce those long-term improvements in living standards. And, you know, that's kind of a classic Cato thing. You know, we talk about this at Human Progress and in my colleague Marion's book, Superabundance. But things have, over the very long term, been getting better. And that's thanks to uh, general, you know, free market capitalist economic principles. And we really should never forget that, regardless of all these other, you know, discrete reforms we, we should pursue. All right. Uh, with that, we will uh, thank Scott for joining us. And uh, the book is the, uh, it's called Empowering the New American Worker. Uh, definitely check it out, especially if you are interested in lots of charts and graphs about uh, economic policy and, uh, and the labor force in particular. It's, it's a really important book, I think, because when they say worker, they mean workers. They mean all of them. They don't just mean politically preferred workers. They don't just mean a caricature of workers. Uh, it means everyone who's not a child and not retired. And I think that, that is, uh, I think that that's really, really important. So check out the book, Empowering the New American Worker. Scott Lindsacombe is the editor. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.